I'm really quite against skincare as entertainment. Our skin doesn't need to be entertained. Skin is probably the easiest to influence. You know, you can't change the shape of your nose without resorting to surgery, but almost everyone can have better skin. Is it something that you feel is part of you or is it something that you do now on a side? I think that the brand has been probably the truest thing to the real me. I'd say that I'm very grateful that medicine has led me to starting a business in a way because I think it brings out the best of me. You can choose your thoughts, just learning to detach a bit better, not clinging on to those worrying <laughs> yeah. patterns and kind of almost being addicted to that stress environment internally, which becomes so normal to you that it's all you know and that you literally start creating it from the minute you wake up. I was, I've, I've always been so harsh on myself. I think you can be a, an achiever without having to have this tight grip on things. I'm not really much one for thinking about things being impossible. But yeah, let's see how crazy things can get. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? That your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. So Sam, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure, lovely to be here. Yes, it's been, I've been really looking forward to talking to you and to meet you and to talk about your brand and sort of your journey to where you are today. So, you know, you are a very highly in-demand dermatologist here in the UK. It's like almost impossible to, <laughs> to make an appointment with you. When did you decide and how did you decide that you wanted to be a dermatologist? I guess I've always been very aesthetically driven and, uh, you know, I was good at science. My mum thought it'd be a really good idea if I was a doctor and I was really competitive. So I studied at Cambridge and UCL and then as part of my medical training, um, I went to, to work in Sydney for a year, so that was interesting. You know, you really appreciate the impact of ultraviolet rays whenever you, you live in somewhere <laughs> like Sydney. And I think it was just a natural fit, you know, combining science with a love of beauty. And I was always fascinated by the impact of medicine and you know drugs on the skin and I think that's you know again I studied pharmacology as part of my degree at Cambridge so you put all that together and it naturally lends itself to an interest in beauty and skincare and the science behind that um, I mean the science of aging and how we combat that and improve the appearance of the skin and the way that feeds into how people feel about themselves all of that really appeals to me I'm a very empathetic sort of person and I really love seeing how transforming someone's skin makes an individual feel so I think I kind of I fell into dermatology in a way but I also I think then naturally leading into business and creating content it all just kind of unfolded. I was in the right place at the right time. It was, you know, I started doing YouTube when, um, I think it was seven or eight years ago now, after I'd done some TV, I was working with a lot of brands. And again, that just kind of was a natural next step. And I think once I built an audience online, um, I'd started to really hone a reputation with beauty journalists, um, I suppose as a go-to person to help sort your skin out. People thought, you know, I was a person to go and see about adult acne in particular. And I think there's been a sort of almost an epidemic of adult acne in the last 10 years. So, you know, these things all just kind of fell into place that led to 
an interest in, I think, helping people in a way that was broader than just being in the clinic. That led to developing a community online and then that led to developing the brand. So I've been very lucky with how they kind of, I kind of ended up sort of going a long way around about doing a brand. But um, yeah, I'm very happy with where I've ended up. Hmm. And going back to the days, you said seven years ago, that's when you started your YouTube yeah, about that. I'd done the TV show for TLC for a couple of years and then I'd worked with a couple of big brands and then that led to, um, I think, just an, an interest in taking back a bit of the space that there were a lot of influencers having an opinion about skincare, but there wasn't necessarily anyone coming from a kind of a medical background and kind of the common sense approach, shall we say. So that was the the rationale for for starting the channel at the same time I was doing in-person events um so inviting people sometimes they're patients other times they're just people who followed me online to do in-person events so we had Dr Sam skincare club and that was really popular and that's what led to the start of our Facebook group which is now something like 23,000 people strong so mm. um the events were just small things like a kind of book club for skincare people came along um we discussed a topic we did that in a nice members club setting in London um, so it's, it's funny how those kind of things start small, but then they kind of snowball. Um, and I guess our YouTube channel is kind of the same, but owning the space of being really honest about what skincare can do for you, where the limitations lie, how you go about solving common skin conditions. I feel quite passionate about putting that information out there in a way that is really actionable mm -hmm. and easy for people to understand. And I think that's why we've just had steady growth um, I think we're at 218,000 subscribers now. So, yeah, I get a lot of joy from that. Hmm. Is it something that you feel is part of you or is it something that you do now on a side or is it something that you feel that, you know, sort of you, your your main focus? Like, how, where do you place it? I think that the the brand has been probably the truest thing to the real me. I'd say that I'm... I'm very grateful that medicine has led me to starting a business in a way um, because I think it brings out the best of me. I think I, I, think I have a lot of different skills. Um, I think I communicate well. I think my attention to detail has really lent itself to making products that make a real difference um, and that have a real point of difference. Um, yeah, my desire to do something different, to create something new and better than what was out there, because I think there was so much space, you know, four years ago when we started the brand to really do things better. Um, and also I love I love growing a business, like building a team, nurturing them, um, having just really kind of high expectations of myself and then, you know, slowly working towards achieving those goals. Um, yeah, it's 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 so exciting and it's different every day one day I'm filming the next day I'm you know planning a new product next day I'm in clinic I mean I'm just incredibly lucky I have a really diverse kind of set of responsibilities um they allow me to yeah to grow every day and there's not many people can say that at this stage in their career so mm. I feel very blessed during the pandemic, there's a new term that's been coined, the intellectual. Where do you think this term is coming from? I mean, where does the interest for, you know, understanding the science, the efficacy of skincare, do you think that was as a result of the pandemic where people were just, I don't know, bored watching YouTube? Or is there something maybe deeper than that going on? I, mean, I think part of it is access. So there's access to information now. So you have lots of um, dermatologists and other, you know, healthcare professionals who are communicating and, and, and sharing a lot of knowledge. And I think maybe 10 years ago, you had to go and see a doctor to kind of unlock that information to find out about the kind of ingredients that we were using in, in, that, in you know, not just for disease, but also for beauty. So prescription retinoids 10 years ago, that was very much something you got from your doctor. Um, nowadays, so there's access, there's, you know, there's information to people like me, there's other dermatologists internationally, Dr. Idris in the US, Dr. Davin Lim in Australia, Dr. Dre in the US. So people have access to, to these people. And, you know, that's really helped, I think, cut through the noise of the marketing side of beauty, really kind of going in for what really does work, where the evidence lies. Um, and I think brands like The Ordinary and The Inky List have increased access to ingredients that previously weren't accessible or affordable. So 
there's been a real democratization of beauty and you know what really works so i think that's driven the interest and then i think people being able to share their experiences so what happens when they use these sorts of things so you know we've all gotten a bit i think um indifferent in a way to traditional marketing and advertising imagery nowadays it's all about user generated content and people using things and, and giving feedback and the kind of the honesty and integrity around that so I think it's a combination of all of those things that has led to this group. They can now find each other, you know, on their Reddit forums and close Facebook groups and things. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time actually for skincare. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of almost obsessive focus on some things. And I think there will be a, a point where kind of it settles in a sort of a, a sensible place in the middle. I think to some extent there can be a little bit too much focus on individual ingredients without necessarily the understanding that comes from understanding how to formulate and how it's not just about a list of ingredients, about it's about the combination interaction of those ingredients together. There is subtlety to it, there is art to it. It's not just a, you know, you build a list of ingredients and they will work, you know. There's nuance, um, and I say I'm not a formulator myself, I work closely with the formulator, but I know what works well together in a formula and I know how to achieve I guess what's desirable in terms of textures and things I guess that's where my forte lies really understanding the consumer need I have a great awareness of what the market has at the moment what the best in class performance of a product looks like and then building and integrating all that information together I think that's what really gives me an edge when it comes to making great products mm. yes I think it's exactly that where you know you act as a not necessarily the interface but somebody who works very, very closely, very hands-on with skin itself, the customers. And it's not just understanding, you know, the science of the skin. It's also what does the eventual customer actually want and how do they use those products on a day? You know, because a lot of it is yeah. to do with habits as well. And what I find fascinating that you're saying about how different ingredients it's not just about you know like as, as you said sh shopping list of everything here and then that's it you're kind of done it's you know they all going to be um, reacting with each other and also the different types of skin I would imagine would be reacting differently to those ingredients as well um, in terms of the science behind skincare and obviously you know you, you know you're saying that you're working with uh, formulators you are creating the products and to some extent also disrupting the skincare industry because it's now forcing bigger brands to pay attention much more to the ingredients that they are putting into their products. Mm. Do, do you see that to yourself? Do you see that the bigger brands are now, I don't know, looking to you or, you know, having to change the way that they have traditionally worked for a long time? I think so. Um, I think there'll always be a degree of caution, though, with the big brands. They'll always play it relatively safe in terms of the concentrations of active ingredients. And they're, yeah, they're definitely not fast adopters. However, um, I think they've had to change. They've had to level up in terms of um, results. It's not enough for a product just to smell nice and feel good on the skin. That's true, because, I mean, during the pandemic, I went down that rabbit hole of YouTube watching. So when you're talking about Dr. Shireen Idris and yourself and um, Cassandra Bankson. Yeah, so, Cassandra. you know, she's she's fun. She makes it, you know, really dramatic and actually started understanding more about what I'm putting on my face rather than, you know, just something that smells nice and sure. and OK, great texture or something just because it's so expensive that you feel like it's a luxurious item and it's going to be really um, efficacious on your face. And as a result of that, um, I started really experimenting with the things that actually made a difference to my face. And I was quite surprised at how cheaply you can also buy certain products that make a massive difference to what expensive products don't. So I guess my question to you is, how do you decide on the price point of your products? So in terms of the overarching premise of the brand, I always wanted it to be a more affordable version of what I do in the practice. And in fact, the way I've built out the range with the kind of sort of focus on the Dr. Sam system, a sort of a structure of kind of perfected basics, um, with your actives built in based on your skin concerns and what you're trying to achieve, the problems you're trying to solve. Um, 
so that had to kind of be the core structure and that very much does work in parallel to what I do in the office just with like less potent non-prescription grade products so patients happily when they get their little printout from completing the routine finder they can see the structure that's very familiar to them so that was the basis of building a daily routine and the idea is always being to make it as simple as possible I mean I I kind of was inspired by the story behind the, Um, the way Steve Jobs and his marketing team approached building Apple, the idea of creating something end-to-end that meant that you didn't have to think about adding anything else in. Um, And perhaps it was that's sort of almost like an old-fashioned kind of approach to think back to kind of Clinique 3 step. But I wanted it to make sense that it wasn't just about selling the customer more products. It was about selling them a streamlined system that's designed to work together and for there to be synergy from using those components together that would be greater than the sum of the parts of using, you know, one or two pieces of the of the routine together. Um, so that was kind of the, the bone structure, um, if you will. And again, the active ingredients that I found that obviously work so well in the practice, um, it was just a question of diluting them to some extent to make them suitable for over-the-counter use without a prescription. But again still pack a punch and by combining multiple active ingredients together you get a, a you know an effect on the skin that's probably not too far off what a prescription grade ingredient could achieve so it's it's kind of using the science and then the kind of the awareness of what people want and you know using the products that actually at the time we were kind of we kept in the clinic as a sort of a jumping off point so there was a couple of moisturizers we'd stock so patients could go away with their complete routine on the day of their appointments so again they didn't have to you know, source anything, just things that get in the way of people doing what you want them to do. Yeah. Um, to make everything as, as easy and kind of guesswork proof as possible. Um, so yeah, it's about building out that kind of package in a way that's elegant, easy to use and easy to get on board with and to be consistent because that really is the secret to, to beautiful skin. It's getting people to stick with something and not hop, which is kind of the default behavior, you know, at the moment with consumers having so much choice. What I really love about your YouTube and your Instagram page is finding out things that I didn't necessarily even think about. So there was one video where you were talking about hands and going to the salon and, um, you know, having your kind of your gel shellac mm. nails. And I always thought about sort of those, I don't know, if it's a UV machines, you know, please don't. <laughs> I probably will not be getting the, the terminology right. But I was like, oh, that can't be good. Like, I don't know, I was worried about my eyes. But what you're talking about is actually the exposure of the UV rays on your skin and wearing SPF. And it's just things like that that I wouldn't necessarily um, even think about. And I think this is where, you know, what you're doing not with your, your brand, but also educating the customer about how to take care of themselves. And, you know, what you were talking about, how when you take care of your skin and how you feel about it, especially as a woman, yeah. that makes a huge difference. And and as a result, that's how you build a relationship with your brand. So this sense of community, I think, is is, is really something that comes across quite strongly. Well, that's really nice to hear. It's very, That's very important to me. I mean, I think... I think if all the things that are components of beauty, skin is probably the easiest to influence. You know, you can't change the shape of your nose without resorting to surgery or your lips or your bone structure, but almost everyone can have better skin. Like, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think it's not that difficult to help people achieve that. And really, you know, the brand is all about teaching you to master your own skin again it's the same principle we have in the clinic we don't make people a slave to the office if we can if we can educate them on how to use skincare to achieve their the results you know it depends how the timeline of course some people want results overnight typically those aren't the kind of patients that find their way to me I think when you read about our clinic and our practice and the way my colleagues and I work together I work with um, two amazing dermatologists Dr Emma Wedgworth and Dr Rakesh Patali and we all have this same approach that you're really building skincare habits for life and empowering people to take care of as much of that as themselves as possible is really, I think it's the best service that we can offer people really. Um, so I think, yeah, that's that's what I want to bring with the brand. You know, you'll never find unnecessary duplication of products. You know, we won't have more than one cleanser if we think that one cleanser is enough to, to suit most people. That's kind of the current status quo. Um 
I'm really careful about what I launch in terms of active products. We launch, launch very slowly and it's in a very considered way. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very, a very practical person when it comes to skincare. I, again, there's no products in there that don't have a genuine need or purpose. Um, the hands thing is interesting. I think yeah, the hand, the hand care market, you know, is, is pretty cosmetic. It's pleasant about putting on a cream that moisturizes. That's all well and good. But I think post pandemic, again, the impact of hand washing has had, you know, quite mm. profound effects on a lot of people's skin. And I think we real we don't realize how much we pay attention to somebody's hands um it's actually one of the first things that we look at whenever we meet someone for the first time it's a way of actually trying to assess whether they're friend or foe as to what they're doing with their hands but you know we our hands are on show but we don't pay anything like the same attention mm. to them as and we it's do not for just on face. show it's like you also have a, a, well maybe not during the pandemic when we're not shaking hands but now that we're back to it that is also something that you've you know that you feel not just see yeah that's true mm. so i think the condition of your hands is very important it's often an afterthought it's often some an area people think to you know not worry too much about active ingredients mm. but again small but measurable changes you know every day using something active so our flawless hand therapy is i think one of the first truly active hand creams um but it makes a big difference and uh, you know put jewelry on it's so much nicer if your hands are also in good condition so mm. not just about your nails you were saying earlier about how you believe that everybody can have better skin. So what three main tips would you give for having a better skin? So I think beautiful skin is is typically radiant skin and it's it's a combination of sort of form and function really. So if the skin is working well, the chances are it will look good too. So um, obviously the first thing you're going to have to do is wear sunscreen every day that's just a given it's the most important reversible thing that we can address 80 percent, possibly more of aging changes so things like sagging pigmentation rough texture broken capillaries all of those changes um, are potentially preventable if you start that habit nice and early i always ask people to look at their outer forearm and their inner forearm and compare the quality of the two and that is the impact of the reversible external part of, of, of UV radiation on the skin. So that has to be um, the first step. And, you know, for those who suffer with breakouts or sensitive skin, that can be a challenge. But again, with kind of the expansion of products on offer and cosmetic elegance of sunscreens in particular, having improved so dramatically over the last 10 years, I think for most people that is a a problem that can be solved finding an, a sunscreen they actively like using so they do stick with it on a daily basis so that's step number one then step number two is is you know good basics so a, a cleanser and a moisturizer that do what is required of them um, and then the third one would be about building in actives that are relevant to your skin concern now for the most part most people will benefit from using a retinoid retinoids are ingredients derived from vitamin a they probably impact somewhere in the region of 3,000 genes in our skin. Wow. It's a big number. 3,000 yes. <laughs> genes. That's incredible. And when you think about that, that is why almost every other active is that bit less important because those are so profound. And I think with the advent of skin intellectualism, it, it can seem like everybody must know that, but actually it's surprising how many people... They might be aware of retinoids, but I think that the often talked about hurdles with starting one can still put an awful lot of people off. So I'm always pleasantly surprised when I do a video on retinoids, how popular they are. And I think it is because there is this awareness that they are the game changer. They are the gold standard of, you know, healthy aging, but they're also, you know, they have their their little uh, nuances and they can take time to get used to them at the beginning. So I think getting people over that hurdle, like we've done a video series on, you know, the retinoid revelations, we've called it just to explain how you can get through those, those tricky times. Sometimes, you know, if you've got acne, you might purge, you dry or sensitive skin, you might get a little bit more irritable, but I believe that for most people, there is a retinoid for everyone, um, aside from pregnancy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I relish that challenge. People coming to see me in the clinic, I've, you know, I've tried retinoids, they're not for me. I'm like, okay, let's just pick that apart, shall we? And then you go <laughs> yeah. into it, you find out what strength, what they were using at the same time. And, you know, oft, more often than not, you find out they were using three other actives. They weren't doing things diligently. They were using a fragrance moisturizer and, you know, just too many products. So 
um, I think streamlining and focusing attention where it needs to be, um, that's really what those kind of three key steps I think mm. are. And I think most people will benefit from that three-step routine. I think we overcomplicate things a lot, but also it's when you don't... <laughs> too much So much choice. You're right. So much choice. Like, how do you go with one brand over the other? And it's really just most of the time it's aesthetics or whatever's being marketed to you or what celebrity that you like that's yes. modeling those products. Instead of actually going down maybe even more of a boring route and saying, well, you know, this moisture as a works it's not an amazing brand it doesn't you know doesn't look amazing doesn't even smell of anything and that is the one thing that makes it work and I'm speaking from my own experience when I was learning about all of these products I think I brought everything under the sun at that point and it was this excitement of trying so many different products and like what's going to make a difference True. almost to the same extent as you'd be buying a lipstick or an eyeshadow because it's new it's fun but actually most things you have to do them for a prolonged period of time consistently in order for them to make some kind of a change and that goes for everything in life not just True. skincare so applying that logic it's a bit unsexy and a bit boring and a bit dull but then what do you ultimately want do you want amazing skin or do you want to have a bathroom shelf full of products <laughs> exactly or maybe even both but you know some are more you know aesthetically pleasing but you know exactly what works and to your point about retinoids even though I've watched so many of your videos and other videos about it, I still haven't taken the step <laughs> to actually try it. It's, it's surprising. I did a press day recently and I think out of 10 journalists, at least two weren't using a retinoid. And it, it just it struck me, well, gosh, these are people who are truly immersed in, in this world. They, they meet all the, the brands, you know, they could have access to whatever products they want. And yet still they had mm -hmm. their own you know, challenges in terms of like getting on board with, with the habit. So yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I do think that being coached in these things really does help people. Um, and, you know, again, that's what I was trying to do with that particular video series was to kind of give people a step by step, a step guide as to what would happen at the different points in that first six weeks. The first six weeks is so critical. It's the first skin cycle. Um, but in a way, if you think about training and getting you know physically fit you don't expect to do that in a week you know um I think we do have to just modify our expectations and set realistic goals and and plot it out the way you would if you were trying to learn a new language or as I say you know run a 5k um kind of distance so it's it's about managing expectations and I think I hope that's what I do I really try and ground people in what to expect and um, to be sensible about things and as you say just to keep them on the path for long enough because eventually if you're using the right ingredients changes will start to happen um, but you know that's that's the challenge and that mm. challenges me as an educator and a communicator so um, I relish that yes I think you're right it's about coaching because one of the hardest things is just diagnosing yourself isn't it where is it you can well i think so because <laughs> it's 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 diagnosing what you know do you have dry even going back to like is it dry skin or oily skin or like what is the one problem that i'm trying to fix you know it's, i think skin type is less important than people think i think that's again marketing right. mantra in reality around 65 percent of people have combination skin it might or might not be sensitive, but at the end of the day, if you strip out the common ingredients that irritate sensitive skin, so denatured alcohol, mm. excessive amounts of fragrance, things like that, and keep the routine simple and don't bombard it with 20 different products being used in rotation, you know, then, you know, focus on one active ingredient at a time and do that slowly. And once you've built that one and maybe get another one in, you know, if you do things that way, most of the time, most people can work stuff out, but it's 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 not kind of getting the foundations right. I mean, we don't have products for dry skin or sensitive skin or combination skin. We have one set of products and we customize the way those are used based on really on sensitivity or not, and then problems. So that's the way I work in, in the clinic. There's a, there's no, we, everyone completes a form about their skincare practices, what they're trying to achieve. There is no box for skin type. Mm. Maybe it's unlearning all the things that we have learned for I mean, a healthy until disregard now. to mantra. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of product categories that are slowly becoming a bit redundant. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, in these cost conscious times, let's not spend money 
on ritual. So I don't believe in double cleansing. I, I think it is an unnecessary ritual. I think if you enjoy it, fine, great, go for it. But you are buying two products, not one. Um, and you are potentially, you know, it, impacting your skin barrier in a way that isn't helpful if you want to build an active based routine um similarly toners i think essences there's a lot of product categories that are pleasant they're nice and they definitely kind of fall into that sort of self-care um behavior which i think is fine if you acknowledge that that's what you're doing it for but i'm really quite against skincare as entertainment our skin doesn't need to be entertained that's our brain at play and we should just be conscious of that I'm going to have to remember that and clip that <laughs> and put that down because there is also this moment where, you know, you're in a rush and, you know, you're doing like the most basic things. And in my head, sometimes what goes through is like, oh, I didn't do enough. And actually, the things that I am doing are probably just as good enough because the ingredients and the formulations and the things that I'm using are actually pretty good things. But even then, it's like this this fantasy of, you know, going in your bathroom and spending, you know, I don't know, an hour, which is lovely. And but in, for a busy person like myself, that is not realistic to do True. every single evening. So I'm really glad that you say that, that skin, what did you say? Skincare shouldn't be entertainment? <laughs> yeah, don't use skincare mm. as entertainment. I think, mm. I mean, at the end of the day, if you choose the right actives, you probably need way less products than you think. I mean, that, mm. that's the thing. Um, so for most people, I'm building a routine based around what they're doing at night. Mm -hmm. If they've got dry, sensitive skin, we'll often be leaving the morning clear. We might even be doing things every second or third day. We do things less frequently. We use less potent products at the beginning. And it might be that just focusing on a retinoid is all that's necessary for someone who has got dry, sensitive skin, who's really mainly focused on preventing the signs of aging. And that all we do is actually titrate up the strength of that retinoid. So that's just basically potentially a four product routine. Mm. And that's potentially the most effective kind of routine around. So I think... If you look at things pragmatically and remove the emotion and the sort of the desirability part of it and actually just focus on results, which, you know, as I say, I think these cost conscious times really are encouraging people to do, then you want the most bang for your buck for the fewest products, right? Mm, definitely. No, I'm with you on that 100%. <laughs> well, going back to your role as a founder of a business, and I know you've mentioned that, you know, you're really enjoying working with the team. What's the hardest thing about launching a skincare brand? I mean, I think taking the step to do it myself um, was that took a long time, actually, to settle into the idea that I didn't need other people. I think at the beginning, I thought I maybe needed to do it in partnership with the brand or at the time I was looking at doing it in partnership with a, a leading pharmacy chain. Um, so I think I think just having the sense of belief in my own abilities and that even though there were things I didn't know how to do that I'd be able to learn them I mean I I've become a bit of an expert in e-commerce I didn't know anything about e-commerce mm. when we started out but I wanted to make the brand really accessible in terms of the price point um which I think you asked me I didn't answer the question properly so that by doing that and making it direct to consumer that was the way to make the products that bit more affordable and I wanted to have them to be slightly less expensive than what people would typically spend in the clinic it was you know, I couldn't do products that were more expensive than what we sold in the clinic currently. Um, so really that made sense to me to kind of stick to that kind of 20 to 50-ish kind of price point. Um, and by doing it direct to consumer, you cut out um, the retailer's kind of wholesale share. So that was the way to make things affordable. And I really did do this with the view to making it a scalable proposition. I didn't want it to be something that was just sold through a few space NK stores in my clinic, you know, and just mm. to look for, for people who, who, who were affluent. So that was really, really important to me. So I guess building all of that out, that, that took, you know, time, energy, and I get a bit of guessing's not right but I mean I you know I I didn't know for sure it'd be it'd be a, an effective launch strategy we launched with one product to me at the time I thought gosh is this a bit of a risk but actually it's turned out to be a really um core kind of brand premise in a way we launch really slowly it's a very intentional people are waiting to buy the products that and generally speaking we're doing this in you know communication with our community so we know what people are waiting for um 
So I think having the initiative to do it by myself, that was probably one of the, the hardest parts of it all. And it took a long time to get to the point where I felt confident to do that by myself. Mm. And then since then, I think hiring the right team, um, the right sort of people to work with me, um, to find the right fit, um, that's been challenging. But then, you know, when it when it pays off, when you do find the right people, it's the best feeling. Um so that was quite challenging, I suppose, to build it up to get into the team to the point now where actually I'm really happy with how everyone's working together and they're really aligned with our values. What else has been challenging? Going back to what you were saying about not having the confidence and not necessarily sort of, you know, like, oh, I don't know everything about it. What, what changed? Um, I mean, I had a very fortunate um meeting with a chemist who worked in a in a manuf- manufacturers who actually they were very they were very supportive of what I had kind of sketched out as my kind of structure for the brand and it meant that I was able to keep my costs very low until we launched so we did everything super leanly and I think probably prior to getting started I thought I needed an investor or I needed the support financially of another entity so I think working out actually there was there were smart ways to do things leanly that I was able to sell fund which means I haven't taken any investment to this point in time so um, I am very independent I have a lot of autonomy which is probably really the most important part of this phase of my career is being able to do things the way I want to do them um yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, th- I think it was just, it was just a, I need to do this. At the time, the cleansers that we were selling in the clinic from French pharmacy brands kept getting discontinued. And I thought, well, if I do nothing else but just launch this one product, I will have met a need for myself, for all the journalists I know, for a lot of patients. I don't really see how this can fail if I keep my costs low and, you know, work out that I've got product market fit right it's very clear very early on that we did with that product and then we had another series of products coming through so I think just doing everything in a slow and considered way and not rushing to get 12 products on the market in the first three months gave us all the, the time in the world to really understand what where the market was going um, we were spot on with what people were looking for at that time it really harmonized with the content I was putting out there um, so I think instinctively we got it right because I knew a lot about the market that I wanted to serve. Mm. But yeah, it was just having the confidence to believe in that. Mm. But, um, what do you think gave you the edge when you said you've got the product market fit right? Because of my position, so I wasn't just seeing patients. I was working a lot in industry. I'd work with high-end brands like Dolce & Gabbana. I'd work with more affordable brands like Cetaphil, um, French pharmacy brands. I learned how to talk to a camera I guess having done TV so I think I you know learned how to kind of translate science into something really palatable and consumable um I think I'm a really top class consumer myself like I think I really know what works I I guess I'd already work to curate products for the clinic um and we would get amazing feedback and often products that wouldn't have been available over the counter. We sort of source cosmeceutical brands. So I think it's that kind of curation of what was good in the marketplace and then using my formulation so science background to really understand what could elevate them in terms of active ingredients and how to make everything work together. I have a really strong sense of aesthetics. I always have. I you know, was obsessed with fashion when I was younger. I think if I hadn't been a doctor, I'd gone into something in, in, in fashion. So I think it's... Yeah, it's a little bit of all of those things mixed mm. in together. So I think the packaging is really clean and modern. Um, I think there's a real integrity with the brand, you know, and I think people pick up on that. They they say the things they like about it, the results, obviously, but also the simplicity. And it it's a simple experience. And the minute you touch the website, the way you get instructed to use the products, the language we use to explain the benefits, it all feels really easy to understand and intuitive. And I think that's what keeps people coming back. Mm. Going back to another hardest thing about being a founder, what is <laughs> what is the hardest thing about being a founder? I think, I mean, I think in retrospect, it would have been a lot easier if I had a co-founder. I mean, as I've, you know, started to hire more senior people, probably in the last really 18 months, to be able to have those top level conversations um, with people who have you know a wealth of experience from their you know previous jobs that has really helped I mean you know we do a lot of stuff on instinct whenever you you're learning a lot um I think having so I think having senior people to basically 
plot with is yeah. um really makes all the difference in the world but um you know there's upside to doing it my way as well you know I have ultimate control and the business is, is going in exactly the direction I want to take it in so mm. It's funny you say that because cons. another another founder on the show said, I asked her what was the hardest thing about being a founder and she said having two other co-founders. <laughs> so, um, but I think pros and cons with everything. Totally. And yeah. having that, a different perspective or someone who's got a different skill to you or um, just on a day-to-day basis yeah. has a different energy to what you're currently going through. They can pick you up or you can pick them up and, you know, a team does make a difference when it comes to just elevating yourself and your knowledge and not having those blind spots so I totally see that Mm. yeah I think because I think it's it's quite lonely when things go wrong as you invariably do um I've been lucky though I have a really good network of people outside of the business other founders people I've met through I, I joined an entrepreneurs club a couple of years ago which has been really helpful um, and people are just really generous when they've been through it themselves. It's amazing how readily people will just pick up the phone to you and give you half an hour of their time to talk something out. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, as I say, I, I really do feel like in the last four years I've changed a lot. Um, I've had to learn how to manage myself, like, you know, which has been a whole process in itself. I'm, I'm definitely kind of very traditionally type A. So really having to learn how to stop take a moment think about things and meditation has helped so much um particularly in the last year to help me really just slow down Mm -hmm. and think things through you know take other people's opinion on board you know just all of that just in terms of um and also focus like I mean really being able to focus on one thing when you've got 20 things demanding your attention how do you choose where to place your attention and focus um because you always want to be doing more and you know the Mm direct-to-consumer business there's so many levers to press in terms of driving new customer acquisition and all the rest of it so um yeah like just how to stay focused on one thing and achieve goals do you have like a routine i'm not talking about skincare routine now but like a a morning routine or something that you do on a day-to-day basis to help you stay focused i mean you're talking about meditation so how does that play into your day yeah, so I, I meditate first thing. So I, I did a course in Vedic meditation at the beginning of uh, 2022. And I've, it's actually been the first practice that's really stuck with me. Ideally, you should do it twice a day for 20 minutes. I mostly do it once a day. And on busier days, I will try and find time for that extra session because I do think at the end of the day, it helps me sleep. And when I sleep well, I am a better human being. Um, if I don't get my sleep, then things go wrong. So um meditation is a big part of it I tend to listen to a podcast in the morning that will get me in the right frame of mind um again prone to anxiety a little bit so um I find that if I can kind of harness my thoughts with something engaging and quite positive I mean I've learned so much from the diary of a CEO you know I think the first one I I listened to was when Stephen Bartlett interviewed um Marcia Kilgore who Mm. since I've kind of gotten to meet and um is an amazingly inspirational person. Um, so I think listening to different podcasts on, you know, founders, but also the Huberman po- podcast on um, practices for living more healthily and, and using science-based tools to do that, that's been really helpful. I, I will frequently use cold water therapy. That helps me. I think that's um, quite a powerful thing, especially if I'm feeling a bit low um, or haven't slept so well that I really find that helpful first thing in the morning um, and I try to journal I don't journal as much as I should but um, I find that helpful too mm. just kind of going inwards but also being very mindful about what goes into your brain from the outside world and that's so true it's what you bathe your brain in is very very important you know right down to the company that you keep and being around other people Mm. who are of a you know on a similar path you're trying to work on themselves um and i guess to bring positivity so um i've yeah i've become really sensitive to all of those things in terms of what brings out the best in me because at the end of the day I want to show up for work in you know my best frame of mind um and I think you know as a leader your energy really has a major impact on everyone around you Mm. so how do I bring out the best of myself to bring out the best in others what one habit would you like to break (laughs) (laughs) um I mean, I'm an overthinker and then I would tend to, I guess, withdraw a bit when I get, you know, particularly kind of 
bogged down in something but at touch wood it doesn't happen now to the same extent I do think I've broken my tendency to ruminate endlessly and I have a, a good number of people I can call up to help me if I'm not if my own practices aren't um breaking the habit but I've wasted a lot of time going over things in a loop without really gaining any new information that helps me make a decision I think sometimes I just you know need to do that thing of like imagine the advice I'd give to a best friend who was going through the same thing but um yeah but yeah I'm, I'm definitely working on that but that mm. has been my biggest struggling where point. do you think that comes from um I think I think it's my personality you know, I think it's from my childhood, the, you know, the person I was growing up, um, I, you know, I worked really hard. I was, I was trying to be top of my class. I was good at sport. Um, I enjoyed, I think, making other people happy with my achievements. I think probably I got rewarded for that as a child, not in a, in a bad way, but I think that's, I'm naturally competitive, but then it also had positive benefits in the people around me. So I think doing well by my own standards is really important for me mm, I and can, they're quite high <laughs> yeah I mean I, I can definitely relate to that because mm. yeah I can definitely <laughs> relate to that it's something that you feel like you it's you know people can say oh people pleasing but actually I feel like it's you know it's it's showing up it's about you know I don't know how can you be valuable to the world as well but sometimes you go so far that you kind of forget to take care of what your own needs are. Yeah. And the fact that you're talking about meditation, it's something that I know I have been personally trying to work on as well, because I'm very prone to these kind of like getting stuck on a loop and going yeah. down this sort of negative vortex, which is, doesn't have any No, it doesn't any influence the outcome. <laughs> no. And having just like completely like these irrational thoughts. And the other day, and I don't know where it came to me, I think I probably saw something on Instagram where it's like, well, you're these negative thoughts, you know, like, you, you know, you're thinking about all these terrible things that can happen to you you know you could just as well be thinking you're the most amazing person in in the world and it's like why are you almost cho choosing your other thoughts I don't necessarily believe we choose that but being aware of it does help to um um to, to work on that but I was like whenever I'm going to have a really weird irrational thought or just kind of being stuck on the loop I'm just going to think of a million pounds falling from the sky into my lap as a way <laughs> to just basically break a loop the pattern I was like oh, if yeah. I'm going to be thinking about something that may be implausible why not think about something that's you know at least have a positive tint to it so anyway I'm kind of getting getting off the tangent here but this this no, ruminating I, I, is I think a big deal the programming I, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can choose your thoughts. I think it's just it's, you need to have that moment of self-awareness where you step outside of the patterns because it is just about fall, falling into patterns and they're etched in. This is the whole, you know, it's neuroplasticity, you know, neurons that wire together, fire together. It's, it's all of that stuff. If you've been doing that since childhood, mm -hmm. it takes a hell of a lot of energy and persistence to unwire and to think of the loops in a positive way, as you just said, to sort of re-implant the new, the new ideas. Um, but I think it, it is doable. Um, I think it's just difficult sometimes to measure your progress, right? Cause you, all you see is your own thoughts and your, but I think you have to look at the way things happen around you then as evidence that perhaps you are changing, you are improving. Um, I'm definitely happier as a person, despite having ever more things to do and be responsible for than I was two years ago. And I think that is a product of, meditation and just learning to detach a bit better mm -hmm. not clinging on to those worrying <laughs> yeah. patterns and kind of almost being addicted to that stress environment internally which becomes so normal to you that it's all you know and that you mm -hmm. literally start creating it from the minute you wake up um, by by the quality of your thoughts but if you can get a hold of those thoughts change the thoughts you bathe your brain in is a good start hence to say thinking about other people's kind of positive stories and you know at one point I was listening to the Steve Jobs commencement speech have you, have you seen yes, that video yes. it's amazing yeah and you know it's it's a bit cheesy and maybe it sounds contrived you're sort of it's this concept of synthetic happiness but at, at the end of the day if you practice it enough it's what you become mm. they become your traits they don't they're not just habits or pastimes. I think in the beginning especially when you're going from one extreme to the other it feels like 
a bit forced yeah. and it is but that's what you need to do to break that pattern right. and if you're doing that on a consistent basis then you're beginning to not only break the pattern but to create a new one yes. and that's the point of it so and it I, becomes automatic after yeah. a period of time so you're not having to sort of auto correct mm. it you just are that's, that's the goal anyway. Yes, no, exactly. <laughs> I'll come back to you another couple of years and see how I'm doing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I was like, let's just review in the next um, yeah. Yeah, two years. What advice would you give your younger self? What three pieces of advice? Oh, I get quite emotional even just thinking about that. Just to be kinder to myself. Yeah. I was, I've, I've always been so harsh on myself and I think you know probably to some extent then holding myself to high standards mean I hold other people and perhaps sometimes I can you know maybe be too tough in terms of my expectations of other people but I think yeah just be kind and enjoy it like I look back on my time at Cambridge which was really stressful um Cambridge medicine at Cambridge was really tough and I just wish I'd relaxed and enjoyed it more. I went back for a matriculation kind of reunion a, a few months ago. And I, I don't know, I saw Cambridge through very different eyes. It was very small and it somehow felt an awful lot smaller than it did at the time. Um, but it's so beautiful and it was such a privilege to study there. But I think I spent the whole time in a state of worry about exams and what people thought about me. I just wish I'd been able to, you know, relax and smell the flowers, as they say. Yeah. I wonder, though, because a lot of people say that, they, you know, be kinder to yourself or, you know, just relax, you know, don't worry so much. Uh, it's going to work out. But not to dismiss how you were feeling at the time, because this is probably the advice I would give myself also to just not take things so seriously and to be kinder to myself. But part of that grounding in the work that you're doing also gets you to where you are now in terms of, you know, level of success or you know get, getting a degree from Cambridge and yeah I just think that's also part of you and accepting that part also mm. is is something that I probably would say to myself I think I think you can be uh, an achiever without having to have this tight grip on things though I, I think you can I think you maybe even are better for it because you think more expansively, you know, having this kind of low level fight or flight response all the time really narrows your perspective. Maybe, maybe I wouldn't have studied medicine. I'm not saying I regret that in any way, but you know, you kind of, you start a career like being, about being a doctor, you kind of feel, I must, I must complete this. I must stay on this path. And in a way, when you start working as a doctor, you aren't in fight or flight all the time because it's, it's a really scary business when you start when you start out and then you push yourself and you get through all these exams. I don't know if I'd been more curious and open to using my intelligence in a broader way, given what I've now discovered about myself and my capabilities, maybe my path would have been different. So it's not that I look back on any on it regretfully, but if I could have harnessed my drive and ambition not from that place of mm. wanting to be good enough and more into that let's let's see how crazy things can get you know mm -hmm. it might have been very different so I think that's that's what I would say to younger people is is to kind of exams are of course super important and, and becoming accomplished but it's real life experience that really matters and it's becoming knowledgeable about yourself that matters again I think we should teach things about mindfulness to young people we should teach them how to manage their emotions we should teach them to to know themselves um or at least to, to have the skills to start discovering that about themselves from an earlier age it would make such a difference to people's satisfaction and happiness i think i'm such a believer in what you're saying and completely 100 percent with you on that because like looking back at my own decisions when i was going at university and the you know, I studied psychology. I don't regret that either. But if I were to really truly follow what I wanted at that point, I probably would not have chosen that, if I'm completely honest. And even talking to candidates who are at a certain stage in their careers, who realise that actually they're not exactly where they want to be and maybe want to make a pivot or a change. And how do you 
start that earlier, that process of really looking inwards in yourself. It's like, what do I actually want? Yeah. How do I what want to feel? Happy. Like, what do I want to do with myself mm. instead of just having all this incoming things and all these external expectations, whether from your parents or the society or, you know, eventually your bosses. It's like, who are you? Like, what do you want? And I feel like we live in a time where we have at least a little bit of the luxury to to choose that now. And I really hope for younger people to kind of make the most of that, make, make the most of that now. Um, so, Sam, what is the one thing that seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve that, will change the course of your life or your business? Um, I'm not really much one for thinking about things being impossible good <laughs> great I um I don't tend to restrict myself like that you know I've done quite a few things that are quite unconventional for a person with a medical career I think the more of those things that I've done the more I realize that I mean I, I could never have imagined as a a young girl reading Vogue that I'd have worked with a brand like Dolce & Gabbana like that kind of blew my mind you know traveling all over the world doing press events um you know, doing a TV show. Like, I, I've done things that su surprise myself still because I, I would describe myself as being, you know, an introverted extrovert or an extroverted, you know, one of those two. So I've pushed myself into situations which are genuinely seem a bit scary on the surface. So I welcome the challenge of the impossible. I mean, my aspirations for the brand are really big. I don't tend to put my time and energy like I have into this without thinking about what the end goal is um so it's really just a matter of you know decoding the steps necessary to get there um and I tend to live quite in the moment so in terms of the future I just I want to keep being challenged I obviously want to keep growing the brand um but yeah let's see how crazy things can get Sam, thank you so much. <laughs> Such a pleasure to have you on the show and to get Lovely to know to you. Here. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.